Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. I'm Amber Bell and this is Real Agriculture. I'm here today with Clint Yerke who is the Agronomy Director with the Canola Council of Canada and we're going to be talking about early scouting in canola and why you should be out there doing it. So welcome Clint, it's great to have you. Oh thank you, I love being in the field so this is a great opportunity to hang out with you and all you fine folks. Yeah, and the rain slowed down. And we got a break in the clouds, yeah, <laughs> so it's even better. Awesome, so we're gonna talk about early scouting. Yep. Now, why don't we get right in, how early should we be going out and scouting? Well, as, as early as possible. Um, usually, with warmer soils, it takes uh, the canola crop six, seven days to start poking through the ground, really depending upon your, your seeding depth. Uh, 10 days, two weeks is probably the, the best window of opportunity in which to, to uh, take a close look at what's happening in the field. So um, not long after seeding. So when you wrap up your seeding operation, you don't have a lot of time to go to the lake and that, unfortunately. You gotta be back out in the field looking to see how things are go coming along. And coming from a cattle background, you know, <laughs> that completely ruins all my notions that the crop guys have it easy. <laughs> Thinking once seeding's done, they're good. Yeah, no, I, I wish it was like that. And it seems like we spend more and more time on the sprayer every year. And so uh, asking them a dead of winter, it's probably not a bad time to be a crop guy. That's but true. Uh, That's yeah, true. not. Not, uh, not during growing season, unfortunately. So during that growing season, what should producers be looking for? What should they be scouting for? So there's two major things that you really want to look for when, um, when you're, you're getting out to first look at your canola crop. Number one is to uh, measure the success of, of your seeding operation. Like how well did you actually establish that crop? How many of those plants are actually coming up out of the ground? And number two is to start looking for problems because Unfortunately, Mother Nature is going to throw a, a wrench in, in, the, uh, in, in your operation in some way. And so the better that you can catch that at the beginning, the, the better you're going to be able to manage it. So looking at the seeding operation and, and then scouting for pests or any kind of issues. Okay, and what can you go into what some of those issues might be and what you'd be looking for as signs and symptoms? Yeah, so um, Environmental issues, uh, weeds, diseases, insects, these are all going to have a, an impact upon your, your plant stand and ultimately your yield at the end of the season and ultimately your profitability. So the, uh, the sooner that you can uh, get a handle for any of these things. Um, really the, the weather events that, that we're most interested in are frosts, early, uh, late season frosts are the, the biggest factor and, and this year is no exception. We have seen some, uh, some farmers that have had some issues in parts of Alberta where they have had cold temperatures and so that has a big impact upon your, your plant stand. Flea beetles uh, for, for the insect side are the, the number one uh, insect that we're concerned at this time of year and, and often when we ask farmers like what is the biggest pest that you're most concerned about flea beetles is always at the top of the list higher than any disease or, or weed or anything. So. Uh, watching for flea beetles and, and uh, ensuring that there isn't any damage and once those damages start climbing then trying to uh, decide when is the best time to pull that the trigger on, on uh, getting in the field with a, with a foliar insecticide. Mm -hmm. And on the weed side uh, it is early um, to, to assess how, how good your uh, weed control is obviously um, but you could certainly look for escapes from, uh, from your pre-seed burn. Um, and particularly uh, looking for um, any weeds that are on the herbicide resistant spectrum. Uh, glyphosate resistant kochia is, is the big one right now. And, and if you are only using uh, uh, glyphosate in your pre-seed burn, yeah, now is a good time to, to start looking for, for when the, when the kochia starts appearing. So those, those are the issues that you you're primarily want to be looking for. And, um, Making a decision as to when you need to get into the field with your first herbicide application as well as is what you should be trying to decide on as well in your first right. scouts. Right. And then you mentioned diseases. Is there anything you can watch for this early in the season with diseases? Yeah, yeah. So say you, you, you seed your crop, uh, maybe it's early, early May. And uh, two weeks later, you're still not seeing very many plants. Maybe there's the odd plant that's, that's coming up. 
if it's cold and wet, um, that's actually not a, a great scenario for, for emerging canola crop. Cold, wet soils usually mean higher activity of, of some of the soil pathogens. Pythium is, is the big one that really likes cold, wet soils. And it's going to do everything that it can to uh, start infecting those uh, germinating seeds. Um, canola seed is treated and it does provide good, uh, uh, good efficacy against a lot of these soil pathogens. But the longer that that seed sits in the soil, um, unemerged, like what, once the plant gets above the, the soil surface and starts photosynthesizing, it gets a lot of energy to fight off any of those uh, root pathogens. But before then, it's, it's really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, th and this is one of the things that we often see, particularly with uh, uh, situations where the seed might have got seeded a little deeper than a grower likes. We, we like to target that three quarters of an inch, but sometimes seed might wind up down two inches, three inches even. It takes a long time for that hypocotyl, the, the, that growing stem, to get above the, the soil surface and a lot of opportunity for pathogens to attack it. So two weeks after seeding, take a look. And if you're not finding any, uh, any plants, then get your trowel out and start doing some digging and see what's happening. Uh, if it's just that the, the seed is almost at the soil surface, then you still might be okay. But if you're starting to see like uh, remnants of, of seedlings that haven't mm -hmm. come up, then, then you know you might have a, a, seed, a seed disease issue. And what would you do in that scenario? Would that be the time to start thinking about a fungicide or...? Well, unfortunately you can't rescue a seedling disease uh, with, with fungicides. I um, uh, wish we could. It's, it's a little bit of a wait and see. Like, uh, probably want to wait another week and just see how many of those, those plants still might make it. Um, usually once the root or that the hypocotyl is, is infected, there's, it's kind of game over for, for those plants. But maybe some of the brothers and sisters that are in that seed are row gonna are going to be fine, right? And then they'll, they'll fill in. So that's where you, you need to have is, is, a, is some type of tool for, for counting plants and try to get an assessment for how many of those, uh, how many plants that you're going to wind up with. Once you start getting below two plants per square foot, um, it, that crop becomes more difficult to manage once you're below one plant per square foot. So the, uh, the decision you really need to make is, is whether or not to go in and reseed. Right. I'll go back to, uh, to this ring. It's, it's really important to do plant counts uh, early season. Um, I, I know that a, a lot of producers are seeding by weight. So five pounds per acre, four and a half pounds per acre, uh, maybe some are even higher than that. But uh, what, we, what we want at the end of the season, we want anywhere from five to seven plants per square foot because that's our best opportunity for maximizing our yield. If you're below five plants per square foot, you're likely putting yourself at risk for losing yield. Uh, above seven plants, well, then you start getting interplant competition and potentially could uh, have an impact on yield. So. When you are seeding, um, seed is really expensive, right? I don't have to tell anybody that. <laughs> but on average, most farmers are putting two seeds in the ground just to get one plant. Mm. So that's 50% of that seed investment is potentially wasted. But we do know that, that there are some producers that are routinely getting 80% of their, their plants, uh, or seeds becoming plants. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there is some that might be routinely getting 30 to 40% only. So it'd be nice if we can get everyone to the 80%, but when we ask uh, a lot of farmers as to what is your emergence rate, like what is the, the survivability of, of, of your seed in, in becoming plants, a lot of farmers actually don't have hard numbers. They, they just, uh, it's just going by gut feel. So quantifying it is, is really important because now we can actually say, hey, I, I actually did get five plants. That was my target. And now I know exactly how many seeds didn't make it. And when you know how many seeds don't make it, then you can start considering, okay, well, what do I need to do to improve that? Is it uh, my seeding depth? Uh, is it, the, um, is it the, the drill itself? Like, do I need to consider maybe a different opener? Is it due to uh, residue that's in the field? Uh, was it just even the, the fact that I seeded into cold soils? And so right. a number of those seeds just didn't make it uh, due to that. So having a, an understanding of of why those seeds actually didn't come up is going to really help out with uh, planning for future success so that you can go from 
maybe being a, a 50% emergence to an 80% emergence as, as a rule. And when you know that you're an 80% emergence, well, then you don't need to buy you're quite as good. much seed, right? Yeah. And, and so, so I'm guessing if you're doing that year after year, you're going to yeah. have a much better handle on what exactly is the reason behind it, right? Yes. You yep. know, oh, well, yeah. I always get this. Yeah. Okay, there was a drought this year. Yeah. Um, Data's power. The, the, right. the better numbers that you have, uh, the better you're, you're going to do into the long term. Right. Yeah. Okay, and so you had that fancy Frisbee. Yeah. Um, is... Uh, <laughs> I'll get the fancy Frisbee. Okay, the fancy yeah. Frisbee. Yeah. So is... This a square in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> this circle has been squared. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> the, this particular circle is is uh, two square feet exactly. So um, the the nice thing about having uh, one like this is that it does fly a little bit, and so you do get a random placement. Uh, I know that back in the old days when I would go out and scout fields, we would just walk out into the field and put your feet out and try counting the number of of uh, plants between your feet. It's bias usually comes in. We so, have our human bias. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So having something that's going to eliminate that bias is, is going to give you better numbers Great. in the end. And, um, and there are a number of tools that are available. Uh, we have some at the Canola Council uh, on our Canola Calculator website um, where you can enter the numbers of, of what, whatever plant counts that you get. And with those numbers, uh, if you have your seeding rate and your, your thousand seed weight, it'll tell you exactly what your, what your emergence rate is, what your survivability is. And so th those numbers can certainly aid you. I, I'm sure that there are other tools out there that uh, growers can access as well. But uh, um, make use of, of the tools that you have and mm -hmm. you'll sure have good and keep success. Data. Yes, keep your right. data. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining yeah, us, Clint. Thank you. Yep. And that was Clint Yerke on Real Agriculture. Thanks.